right. This is going to be awesome. Uh, Adrian, Jeff, Henry. Uh, so Sounders, Whitecaps is like this close. I like this. It's I like awesome. This. Should I sit in the middle? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, these guys have some, some incredible business and tech experience. Um, and they also happen to own some uh, pretty cool sports franchises. So I think this is going to be... It's going to be a lot of fun. I think you're going to learn something from this panel. Um, so let's, let's just jump right into it. I wanted to start broad. Um, just from, from a high-level view, I want to know how technology has helped you win, uh, do, win three things. Win games, win fans, and last but not least, win revenue. So where does technology fit into those three, three things? Win games, win fans, and also make money at the end of the day. I could, yeah, go. Yeah. As the loser uh, at, the, <laughs> at the panel today, um, the last place team, I guess we haven't done enough to win games using technology. Um, no, I, I, you know, look, the winning games piece uh, is, uh, is something we started early on, I think. We, uh, I, I think we've been leaders, I, I don't think, I know we've been leaders in, uh, in uh, sports science. Uh, Dave Tenney, who runs our sports science department, is here, uh, runs a couple of symposiums annually, uh, uh, sits on a, a panel with FIFA on uh, the integration of, of uh, tech and, and sport uh, and data. So, um, you know, but, but obviously that stuff, it's very, very difficult to know where those infinitesimal advantages are over your, over your competition. We're in a game of, um, you know, that, that has been statistically proven to uh, involve more luck than, than the other sports. Um, and, uh, and, you know, what all we can do is try to, to control some of, uh, you know, control the controllables, which are, uh, to some degree, soft tissue injury, uh, getting players back from injury quicker, um, and getting them tuned and optimally performing on, on game day. Uh, but, you know, whether the, the ball hits the inside of the post or the outside of the post is, uh, is you know, is certainly something that is harder to control. Um, uh, you know, maybe I'll let these guys go on with the other. Yeah. Well, I think, I think first, <clears throat> just speak from the club, I'll do an MLS answer on this one. But from our DNA, we went from... Uh, Right out of the gate with my partners, Greg Kerfoot, technologist uh, in there, Steve Lusso, longtime chairman and, and CEO of Seagate Technology. Our DNA is about technology. So it was not something we thought we need to integrate or maybe we'll do a technology group. It's threaded in our entire thinking, on the field, off the field. So, so our, our founding, our DNA of, of at least this MLS generation the last eight years is really, really um, fundamental what we do. So our philosophy right now, we have no silver bullets. There's nothing magical we found, but we have a philosophy which is we're building a digital platform across every part of our business. We're bringing in right people to be able to capture. We're capturing as much as we can. We're trialing as much as we can. Third parties, in-house, stuff from centralized from the league, big borrow steel. And to this point, you know, we're only in our sixth season in MLS under this sort of uh, thought. Uh, there's nothing magical that we, we, we found. We just know that, uh, as the commissioner said, except especially under our structure in our league, and, and Henry's coming in, is we need to find every advantage we can. And so that's our, that's our, more, our, our approach. Do you have a different perspective? You're coming in. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm the lucky one on this panel. We're not playing, so we're totally undefeated this year, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> But, but actually, you know, in all seriousness, that, that actually was a very deliberate thing we decided to do because uh, we wanted to focus on really uh, being able to build an organization from the ground up, uh, build really, I'll say, a culture and approach to how we did things. And I think very similar to Jeff, you know, like we got to find every advantage in this sport and technology off, often off, uh, offers the best shot at it. But, um, but really, there's, there's one major thing that I'll say technology has been extremely useful to us. You know, Don, uh, the commissioner, ha had mentioned that in terms of all the data we have on our fans, et cetera, a lot of these lists have been really the, one of the first engagements that we've had, fans in the Los Angeles area, obviously using all these kind of digital tools in terms of social media, et cetera. We've been able to, you know, without really having um, a single player, a single coach, we've sold 7,000 uh, ticket deposits already. And we're doing this one for one. So it's not that you put a deposit down and can get eight tickets. So 
Um, we're pretty excited about where we are. You know, we're still more than a year and a half out. Um, and we do expect to kind of hit w what is our kind of cap and goal, about 15,000. And of course, we've learned a lot from best practices here at Seattle, um, you know, from, from Jeff and, and, the, and the White Caps organization. You know, one of the great things about our league is how collegial it is in terms of, of building fan engagement, uh, turning people onto the sport and obviously onto our league. Uh, so from that point of view, you know, we've been very, very, um, try to be very thought forward in terms of really, I'll say, this campaign to 2018, because it's kind of what it is. We're selling a, a vision and a dream, and, and we're trying to represent at least the culture of what we think, you know, f football or soccer can be in LA for such a, a, a large city and, and such a, a ethnically diverse city. Yeah, I wanna get into the vision for you later, but I don't think every sports owner has the mindset that you three have as and you say tech is in our DNA. Um, and Jeff, you ran, you were, you were Yahoo's 12th employee, you ran the company from 95 to 2002, it's crazy times. Um, is having that tech experience as an owner uh, a strategic advantage right now in the sports world? Because we're seeing this, it's almost a pattern in the NBA and the MLS where a lot of these former tech execs, Steve Ballmer included, who will be up here next, well, is, that a, is, that a good, is that an advantage? I, I, not, not patting myself on the back, but in broadly speaking, uh, the answer is yes. I, I can talk from the San Francisco Giants. Um, my last year just came off the Yahoo board in 2002 slash three, and, um, and at that point in time, the San Francisco Giants uh, proactively recruiting people to come into the ownership group uh, looking for, for technology, right, to really have that underpinning. So we all saw the wave coming. Look, I'm, I've been around, you know, I remember sitting, you, you thought this is surreal to be standing here, right? I remember when the ad market, when we did the first B plan of Yahoo, was uh, digital ad market, was about $40 million, right? It'll be $200 billion this year. So uh, do things move rapidly? Uh, absolutely. But I don't think, especially in North American sport and especially uh, in soccer and our role that we have to build a game. It's different to have a massive NFL uh, baseball where you sell 70, baseball sells almost 73 million tickets a year and you're, you're not preserving but you kind of are. We're trying to double our fan base. So you're, 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 trying, to, you're trying to super serve the ones that are in and they're early adopters and they're committed and they're wonderful and good question from the, the uh, Obatheni question coming up earlier. But also on top of that, it's a real tough business because our job is to five, five million more. And that's, that forces you to be, look at all options and technology in every aspect is, is critical. I, I just add to that, that, that you know, I, I think we, we are slightly unique in, in sports, but like there aren't any professional sports franchises that aren't paying attention to technology. They, they may or may not have technology owners, but um, you, you, you can't survive uh, if you're not paying attention to it. And, and that comes in all different areas. And to, to Jeff's point, you know, everybody, you know, people ask, okay, who's doing technology really well in professional sports? And there really is no answer. Different, different teams are doing certain things well. Uh, teams that are dabbling and trying a lot, I would say, are, are doing things well. Um, the other area that really hasn't come up today yet uh, is, is, you know, a lot of what we think about is, you know, can we, can we limit uh, fan pa pain points? You know, what are, what are the pain points to entering and, and becoming a fan, uh, to the stadium experience, to maintaining connection to the team? Uh, so, you know, technology, for the sake of, t sometimes we, you know, think that maybe technology for the sake of technology is good, but, but we have to be solving problems and, and, you know, creating opportunities and, and finding ways to improve our businesses, not just to, to, to create it because it's cool. Can I, can I squirt something in? I know there's a ML BAM person out here, or let's just BAM tech, but speaking from the ownership group in Major League Baseball twice, twice that I'm aware of, and maybe there were some other meetings, we looked at shutting down ML Bam, back in the early days. Uh, it cost money, it was draining money out, uh, couldn't see around the corner, uh, not sure it was gonna be there. So something now today valued at, I don't know what the latest value is, three and a half, four billion for Bam Tech, just the platform component of it. So, and that, and that was in 2000, you know, one, two, three, four, right? This is not too long ago. So it does take patience, and it takes planning, and it takes purpose, and it takes focus, and it takes commitment, uh, all along those lines, and you will then be able to see the, the fruits of it. And I feel like from uh, giving more Major League Soccer answers now, we're still relatively 
early stages because we're onboarding new teams, which means new markets. Um, so it, we're, we have to be extra committed to it at this point. And the new aspect of it is, is exciting. And Henry, 2018, uh, and Adrian, you mentioned the in-stadium experience. And Henry, you've said that you, you want the LAFC stadium to be a cathedral for soccer. Yes. And there are a lot of pretty badass stadiums out there. How are, how are you going to do that? And does tech come into play at all? Well, actually, tech does come into play um, because you have to think about really our, our modern fans and, and our modern audience. The commissioner, again, alluded to really how uh, skewed towards a much younger audience uh, in terms of uh, sports fans that MLS is. But I think first and foremost, you know, people come to the stadiums because they've got to have a great experience. It's got to be visceral. You know, you want to uh, design a venue that the sights, sounds, everything just kind of adds all together. Because no matter how great VR gets and all those things, there isn't going to be something that replaces true reality, right? Um, but on top of that, though, you have to also know that you're serving a generation that's growing up extremely digital, connected all the time. So that means that in our venue, you know, we're going, we're thinking very, you know, uh, forward in terms of making everything fiber, uh, building in like the most advanced uh, digital antenna systems, and these are big investments to make. Um, and, and if you ask me, do we know exactly how we're going to use these all? We don't know yet, but you know, there are particular, I'll call it challenges when it comes to the game of soccer uh, for an in-venue experience. One is, you know, if you look at it from a per cap spending. Right? It's a game with continuous action, so there's not a point between the second and third inning that I can get up and go get a hot dog or beer. Maybe a robot can deliver it for you. <laughs> yeah. Drones. Drones, Drones, yeah. Drones, sorry. Yeah. We'll drop the beer from a high or something. Um, but, but there is all this talk about how can we make that ordering of, of food or drink or beer uh, easier? Can we do in-seat delivery? How do you then design the stadium? Because you would design it quite differently versus a walk-up. So, so we've, we've been going through this whole process, and you know, it's exciting to think about, but at the same time, I think back to just what's the pure experience, right? We want the fans to want to be at the stadium. Uh, we want them to you know, be rowdy, be happy, you know, feel the energy and excitement, and I think that's still core to it, and then how do we use technology, really, that is an ancillary or even augmented experience? Because sometimes, for instance, especially in the game of soccer, like, I may have just turned away or even looked down my phone. I want to see a replay, right? So even things like that, that you got to build in all the infrastructure uh, and, and lay, if you want to put it, the foundation to, to do that right. So just on that, if I could put my Giants hat back on. But um, so we built a new park, AT&T Park, in 2000. It actually, though, we, we were the first North American stadium to go full deployed Wi-Fi with all access points. That was only 2000 and, 2004. Now we push 100, 100 terabytes of data uh, across, so we're back and forth with the Dallas Cowboys and rival who pushes more data during during a, during a year. We have uh, six, you know, 1,800 deployed uh, antennas under seat. Uh, AT&T has been our partner. We're not allowed to mention the money they put in. I can tell you, it is tens and tens of millions of dollars. So we've been a petri dish. For, for being in there and been in the Bay Area, you can't cut corners, right? Because we in a scrupulous uh, fan base who come in there, and if it's not working, you're, you're gonna you're gonna know you're gonna know about it. So I, I, the one line I'll do on that one, what we've learned, if I could get, do it in, in like talk, is uh, we thought it's actually I had this conversation with Mark Cuban after he left Yahoo and bought Dallas Mavericks. He had this idea of of screens in front of everyone, these big seats, basically almost like a theater, were interactive. And he realized the one thing pretty quickly, which is to Henry's point, and Adrian knows his cold of this amazing fan base here, is the, it, you, it's a, sport is a social event, full stop. Right, 2.67 tickets are sold, leaving groups and, and uh, individual. No one goes, very few people go to a game by themselves. Secondly, that's why 70% of people have their smartphones and are pinging their social media because they want to tell people what's going on, what's happening. So it's very social. So you don't want to fight that. And, and so we found with the Giants, and Mark found this in, with, with the Mavs, you were fighting that, trying to get the newest app and the different ways of looking at camera angles. And during that precious 90 minutes in football, or, or four hours, six, 20 hours in baseball, no kidding. Um, uh, uh, why are we skewing up on our demos um, on that side? Is you, you, you gotta let that social element go on there during the minute and, and concentrate. There's lots of other touch points, three, 365 other days, different ways of getting at those people. Yeah, that, that's super interesting, but 
it's nice to watch a game at home, and it's becoming nicer and nicer to have my TV, to have my bathroom there. I don't have to pay for parking. I got Twitter on my laptop. Uh, so how do you, you know, provide technology, like maybe streaming, to, to serve that fan? Maybe they don't live in Seattle, maybe they live in Japan or something, they want to watch the game. But also, still you want to sell tickets to the game, right? So how do you balance that in terms of pleasing the fan at home, but also still bringing people through the turnstiles? Yeah, I, mean, I think you have to optimize for both. Uh, um, you know, we, um, the, again, back to the in-stadium experience, I think that's where we probably put more of our energy and it, it's more of what we can affect today. Um, but, you know, again, back to pain points. Um, uh, can, can you help with parking and ingress and concessions and upgrades and... Wi-Fi and social networks and, and uh, um, user-generated content that, that could be used throughout the game. Uh, and, you know, a, a real-time uh, uh, data that, that uh, uh, comes to fans and uh, um, replays. And, you know, so creating that overall uh, experience. Um, uh, and then, uh, obviously, you know, the second screen, the, the, the whole at home experience is something that is going to, you know, is going to change dramatically over the next five, ten years. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, uh, AR, VR will have a huge impact um, in both the, the in, in stadium and uh, uh, at home experience. Um, you know, I don't know what those changes will be exactly, but the ability to uh, have that social experience while sitting on your sofa as well. Um, with your friends who are watching from their sofa, um, huge opportunity there. So, so again, we need to we need to keep doing both. Uh, they're both significant sources of revenue, which ultimately you know drives these businesses. And and uh, yeah. So I, all that I just want to add on top of that, which is I know it's tech, and I know I'm the Yahoo guy, but once again, that it's social and great theater, right? And, and all those technology to help make that in place. And then, to me, but it's segmentation. You know, we, we, at BC Place up the road, we have 12 neighborhoods at our stadium, and we're looking to segment that even further. So at the end, for some people, it's second screen and sometimes third screen, and that matters. For other people, they're literally old, old school, and they wish we had standing terraces. Right, so you, you've you got a segment. And then the other thing I always tell people is the big clubs, Real Madrid, Manchester United, all the clubs that we can rattle off, 97% of their fans never see a match, right? Um, and the Whitecaps, we do all right, 22,000 are average. We're not quite here, we're getting there. But we have 3.7 million people throughout British Columbia who recognize the Whitecaps brand and follow in some way, which usually means I check the score every once in a while. 3.7 million people, and we average 22,000, 80,000 for our TV. So we might touch 100,000 and a little bit more on our website. But what, are we, what am I saying? There's hundreds of millions of people that you can digitally connect with, feel involved, bring inside that community. They don't necessarily come and, and watch the 90 minutes. Yeah, I'll just add to Jeff's point. You know, don't forget, we're part of a game that is very, very global, right? Commissioner Garber talked about it. The rules are the same and everywhere. And, and I think it's what's surprising, you know, I've, I've spent my life, a uh, big part of my life as an, an expat abroad, and I can tell you many, many more people have heard of the Seattle Sounders and the Vancouver Whitecaps than the Seattle Mariners or the Seattle Seahawks. It shocks most Americans, but I guarantee you that it's a manifold, like, because that's how big the game is globally, and that's where technology now is helping us because, you know, people around the world are curious. They are watching MLS. You know, it does help to have some global stars, but they also have heard about the great game day experience at the Sounders or at the Timbers. So these are things that actually are going to be, I'll say, um, advantageous for us as a league because there's already, you know, interest in this sport at a level that is many, many times over interest in any of our sports here if you're talking about number of fans. You want to show, those fans want to watch live games, right? But if they're in Japan or England, they probably can't, there might be a way, you know, a sketch way to do it. And we're seeing more of these streaming deals, we've heard of Twitter and NFL. Um, and Jeff, this is interesting for you because you own part of Comcast Sportsnet Bay Area down in the Bay. And does these, do these streaming opportunities, does, does it create tension with the existing deals you have with the cable companies? Or do you see more as, a, as an opportunity to reach these global fans that we're talking about? 
Yes, it creates tension because my, my kids are going to good schools because they spent the time at Yahoo changing the classified business. It's inevitable. The consumer demand and pull and how they want to consume media, kicking and screaming, you know, who doesn't want to protect their, their multi-billion dollar companies? I've tried it at Yahoo and didn't really work that well at the end here. Um, and so you have to be able to adapt and, and move, move forward. So the answer to your question is, do fans, consumers, want to have a, a multiple options to view their favorite teams, the answer is without question. And it's coming in waves. Hence, ESPN's moving in real time and little companies coming. So there's a whole bunch of, of things going on. As a team owner, or and it, we're at the league level too, we see it all. You, 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 we have to prepare for multiple outlets to our, fa our, our fan base. And we'll bump up against the ESPN, uh, Fox, and Univision wonderful deal that the commissioner and, and Gary Stevens have got. Absolutely. But, we have to be prepared for that or we won't be serving our fans. I want to go back to the in-stadium really quick. And the first part of that experience is going through the gates with your ticket. And Adrian, uh, the Sounders rolled out a mobile ticketing for a full-on rollout for season ticket holders. And it was a shift from the plastic car that they used to use. So they're shifting from this physical thing to on, on the mobile the official T-Mobile app. And recently the team announced that there's actually gonna be an alternative option for next season. So what happened there and what is that alternative option and, and what did you learn from, from this season so far using going, going with mobile ticketing? Yeah, I, uh, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a huge believer that mobile will be, you know, ubiquitous and, and effectively, you know, the companion for almost every single fan uh, at some point. Uh, we, took, we took what we thought was a reasonable but fairly aggressive approach um, at, at effectively saying you, you have two options, mobile or, um, or paper tickets, which we had actually tested in some of our playoff games and everything went fine. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, but, but upon doing that, we, you know, we certainly learned that there, you know, we have different types of fans and we, you know, we talk about a lot about millennials and, and tech, but um, we like to talk about uh, uh, someone in our office, a, a woman named Maya, our legal counsel, her mom, uh, who is a huge fan. But she, you know, in fairness, she doesn't want to engage in, in, in technology in the way that most of our fans do. So we, you know, we need to make sure that, that we are listening to as broad a, a, a cross-section of our fans as possible. We also need to make sure that, you know, when we use technology, it is absolutely solving problems and solving pain points. Um, uh, so, you know, some lessons learned, but, uh, you know, that said, the, our, our adoption rate was uh, about double what we expected. Um, uh, we, um, we've had, you know, really good, along with some challenges and, and uh, complaints, we've had a lot of people, uh, you know, proactively tell us that that is, you know, the way they want to uh, um, want to use our uh, product. The other piece to the puzzle that I think will, will have a big impact for, for us is our, you know, our stadium is, is beginning to, to work towards um, investments in, in other POS, uh, uh, ingress into the stadium that, that maybe we can, you know, effectively use the mobile device uh, as well and, and solve multiple pain points uh, at the same time as opposed to, you know, effectively putting a plastic card on a, on a mobile device. And Jeff, you're an investor in GameTime, which is a fast-growing app, a tick mobile ticketing app that makes it fairly easy to just hit a few buttons on my phone, and I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the stadium, basically. I use that as my ticket. What's your, where's, mobile, where's ticketing going, and is everyone going to use their phone to get in the game in two, three, four years, or does there always have to be that paper option for the, the small, or the, for the segment of fans that I want I think that? Adrian nailed it there, and, and I said it earlier, and Henry gets it, which is you, you have to segment and you have to move along with your different constituencies. So our uh, game time app is, is incredible, but it's targeted 18 to 34. It's, it's the on-demand market, Uber, hotels tonight, et cetera. They've decided, they being 18 to 34, and critical, 
critical to all sporting teams. Major League Baseball is just coveting that group of people. They've decided the most valuable thing is not necessarily what's on that ticket price, even with dynamic ticketing. It's uh, I will decide when I go and where I go and where I sit. Some, sometimes I'm going with my buddies, and I'll sit, I'll sit out in the bleachers, and I'll have beer, and that's, that's fantastic. Now I'm in a business mode, and I'm taking Henry and Adrian. I'm going to drop down behind home plate. And I want to be able to make that decision when I want to make that decision. And the majority of our tickets are sold on day of. And, and everyone thinks, okay, haven't we seen pe people dumping cheap tickets last minute? That's been around for a long time. will be forever. <laughs> and if you look at it, the majority of them are actually some of our premium. So it's just saying, this is, what I, this is what I want today. So that segment, critical, is absolutely 100%. And then as an owner, the greatest thing, that, the joy moment is you cross the threshold, you get scanned, your access, and now your, your app's open, because a lot, a lot of app companies, a lot of people trying to touch our fans, they're trying to get that app open, right? It might be on my phone, but when I get inside, I have them pinged open. One thing about having the ticket, you can't get in without that. So having that element and be able then to integrate into POS and et cetera, so it has my personal, it's all about personalization at the end of the day, right? It's one, you wanna be involved with the club. This is a, 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 a group, a community, so we're a community today, right? Snapshot, we're all in the same thing. And the other one, everyone wants a personalized experience to come out. If I'm gonna give you something, my time, my money, my data, especially my data, I want a Jeff Mallet experience at the Vancouver Whitecaps game. And that's your, that's your, that's your social commitment to, to that person. And if you keep that in mind, you eventually will get there. Any thoughts, Henry, on what, is LAFC going to offer that old ticketing option? Uh, well, of course. I think uh, exact same thing. I don't, I don't have anything new to add there. But I do think, again, to Jeff's point, which is how do you really create something, you know, an app over your phone that is really engaging? It could be uh, an AR function, like, you know, if I put up the camera on Dempsey, you know, I can see his stats or, you know, something like that. Um, Maybe it's just even something fun and frivolous like Snapchat, like, with, you know, put a filter on him, put a cape on him while he's running, you know? So it's, it's that type of thing that could be all this type of entertainment. But on top of that, too, when we're talking about even food ordering, maybe it doesn't make, uh, or it's not easy for us to logistically get it to your seat. But what we can do is you can put in the order, and I can give you the approximate time, and you just go and pick it up. You're not standing in line. You don't have to pull out cash or credit card. There's your ticket, 577, go get it, and you're done. So, so those are the things where, again, it's the app, but when it comes to something real world like food service, et cetera, you would design your kitchen and counters completely differently than if you did this, the, the regular you know, sort of stand and order and, and pick up, right? So, so that's what we're trying to make sure we do with our food service partners, with our technology partners, and, and truly integrate it. Let's talk about LAFC for a little bit. It, you've done some cool things so far. Uh, you brought the first McDonald's to Vietnam. That's, that's pretty cool. But now you get to start this franchise. And I would imagine it's like drafting a fantasy team, but like a million X, because you've got to think about more than just your roster. So what's kind of going through your mind at this stage? A couple years out, you, this is, that's a lot of fun. I mean, you get to create. You get to start all these new things. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, this is probably what the three of us completely share up here, which is, you know, we love building organizations from scratch, you know, uh, take an idea and try to take it to its full realization. And on top of that, I think we all love sports. So for me, this is kind of the intersection of the two things I really, really love. Um, actually, what I, I don't know if you did know, but like, I'll call myself kind of like a counter programmer because in Vietnam, actually my first opportunity to really build a sports organization is that we built a pro basketball team in the city of Saigon, right? And that basically is, if you asked 100 people in Vietnam what's their favorite sport, 98 say soccer, right? Zero said basketball about five years ago. Today I'm really proud because we did do a poll. I think six now say basketball. You know, like 92 say soccer and two everything baby else. Baby steps, baby steps. So we, we've made, you know, that's almost an infinite gain, right, on zero. But, but I almost feel like soccer in America is almost than the other thing, right? Which is, you know, um, the thing for me is living abroad makes you realize that, like, Soccer is the only sport that matters anywhere around the world. And I'll even take it a step further. You know, I kind of have this little conceit. I ask my friends, like, what do you think the global language is? And everybody says, oh, English, of course. Yeah, it's now the, the de facto language. Like, no, soccer is the global language because I can go anywhere and I can just tap somebody and go, hey, Ronaldo, Messi, right? <laughs> and, either, and either we get into a fight because we disagree or... Um, you know, we're best buds because we both think Messi is awesome, right? So, 
but, but that's what I mean of just how powerful sports is and how powerful, you know, these, these things that we do when we're talking about the business of sport. It, it's a really, really special thing because there's very, very few things that brings people together like sports. And I think in our growing sort of disaggregated world because of media, because of our personal devices, it's kind of nice to be able to get, you know, 40,000 people together tonight to cheer for our team, right? That's the way I would say the magic of sport will always endure. We can layer technology on top of it, but the, the presence of it and being in the moment, I think these are all these things that, even as technologists, we're trying to augment that core fundamental experience. Can I just add an example of that? I, I don't know if people uh, watch online Copa 90, uh, so football, crazy football fans, but it's the actually the largest digital football network out there, about 11 million weeklies out there, but they just did uh, Euro. And the way they covered it was unique. They had, uh, on most match days, up to 120 contributors. Uh, they had it in like 52 countries. So they had a general theme for these contributors, right? It was Wales, Wales or Iceland or whatever the story of the day would be. But they would be there. So in a real-time basis, basically using smartphones with a, with a really cool little app. I'm not directly involved yet. So it's called Greenfly, which allows you to uh, capture it, have of, of broadcast quality, and it gives rights management to it. Had all of this going on, 120 people, 50 different countries, real time, that's a daily show. Instead of being us three flown in behind the desk in Paris, which ESPN did, and we can be pundits on that one, but you didn't get the essence of what's going on from the fans' perspective. And those are the types of things where technology is, is usurping, going around uh, the traditional broadcast outlets. Yeah, players trust is another you know, new media outlet for players to go directly to fans. Most people probably know that, but you know, a way to bypass the, the traditional media and get their messages out, so. Yeah, let's talk about the players a little bit. Um, I know the Sounders have, or you've said in the past that you've used the data and the metrics to influence decisions about whether that guy starts, whether he's benched, whether he's off the team. So where's the balance between going with your gut on something and looking at the data and saying, we need to get this guy out versus, actually, I think he's trying pretty hard. Let's, let's stick with him. Like, wh where's the balance there? And what do you rely on more? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's an imperfect science. Uh, uh, and it, it, it really is more art than science. I think even our, our sports science and the people collecting the data would, would say that. Um, you know, soccer is, I, I think, you know, maybe there's going to be some discussion about mentality as well and the, the, the mentable, non-tangible parts of parts of the game. Um, uh, all we can do as well, you know, and there are different layers of decision making within the organization as well. There's the data collection, there are the medical people, there's the coaching staff, there's the scouting group, you know, and everybody uh, has their, everybody interprets the data a little bit differently and um, you know, and, and it's no secret that uh, if a coach has a really good player uh, and a lot of pressure to win a game and a player that maybe the data says, you know, there's a higher risk of injury, the coach ultimately may have to make a decision to, to, to play that player. And um, so, again, you know, all we can do is uh, collect as much data as, as possible, give as uh, uh, good of information to the different layers of the organization, and then those, you know, the people making the decisions need to, to, to make their you know, recommendations or, or, or ultimately, um, uh, you know, live with some, some uh, um, but what, their interpretation of that data. So absolutely spot on. I'll just, I'll just give an example. Uh, San Francisco Giants, by the way, I grew up in Victoria, British Columbia, so the Mariners are my second team. But with the Giants, uh, I can tell you that we were stumbling along, riding Barry Bonds for too long. We, a free agent market seemed to go into nowhere. We started getting data analytics from our de player development side of things. So our coaches, Brian Sabian, still our president of baseball now, uh, an old curmudgeon from the Yankees days, if people know him. Dick Tidrow, if there's any other baseball fan, his nickname's Dirt. When your nickname's Dirt, here's for two reasons. One, he was dirty uniform, and one, he's old as dirt. And <laughs> these were our great guys, but they, they adapted and brought in the folks to do the data analytics. But my, my, my always thing, and this goes for Darby County, is to talk about going to a club that is 1884. 
1884 versus 1974 for the Whitecaps is context is king. That's, and that's what you just said. Context is king. You better have the right people and the right there that, that when that data gets rolled up and you get layers and, and on it, that people will be able to put that in context and then act upon that data. The data's not going to run it. Right, the data's not going to decide that, you know, that the the flight was late coming in, and his wife just had a baby. This is real too with Jordan Harvey. He didn't test well, but Jordan Harvey came in, our, our left back, and sometimes plays right. Said, "I need to play, I need to play from a kid." And Carl Robinson, our gaffer, our coach, said, "Get out there," and he had brilliant games. Stats said, "Do not put him in. Hasn't slept. Not ready." And that's context. So the stats do lie sometimes, actually. I, I don't know if they, they lie, but they have to be interpreted. They're, 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 just, they're just numbers up until that point and yeah. words. I mean, if I could just add there, I mean, all of these new technologies are, are better tools, right? But you only build something if you're a good craftsman. You know, if you have, you know, better tools, but you're horrible at making certain decisions like that, then you won't end up with a good product. So, you know, you got to have both. You know, you got to have both the art and science to this. And just one more thing, I, you know, we, we, this evolves too, you know, we, we come up with algorithms that help us make, help us make decisions or interpretations, and then we change the algorithm the next year, and, and, you know, and the data may lead to a different conclusion. And I'll, you know, again, on the business, you can take this to the business side as well with, with predictive analytics on, is a season ticket holder going to renew a season ticket? What's the percentage likelihood? And you may call a season ticket holder that has a 12% likelihood, and they're like, of course, I already, you know, yes, of course I'm in. I, you know, and the 99%er might say, no, I'm out. And, and so, um, again, you know, the, the, the data, the data does, does lie occasionally. Well, that was an awesome discussion. Thank you so much, Adrian, Jeff, Henry, for that. And uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>